This is Herschel Black. <laughs> He's been a member here at this church for six, seven years, maybe? <laughs> no, I'm way off on uh, that. Probably add a zero uh, on the end of it. How long, Herschel? How long have you been a member? 55. 55 years Herschel has been here. Herschel has forgotten more than I'll ever remember in my lifetime. Anyway, I am honored to have him up here, and I asked him a few months ago, while he was in the hospital, as he was regaining consciousness, as he was regaining strength, and I said, you need to tell this story, because what God has done and is doing in you needs to be told. And what I love about worship, it doesn't just take one form, and so it takes a lot of forms. Like today, it's going to take the form of a conversation. So Herschel and I are going to have a conversation today. And I want you just to hear his story, not from my words, but from his own words. So a few months ago, you went in for a knee replacement. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And that went well. Everything was fine and in they said you cannot kick anyone yet, but you have to go home, get the rehab in, and you were and planned. And then something went terribly wrong after you came home from the hospital after that knee replacement. Would you tell me, tell us what happened then? Well, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, he did ask me while I was still out if I would speak to y'all. <laughs> and so uh, in a moment of weakness, I agreed to, and I, I feel guilty almost because most of y'all know more about what went on than I did <laughs> because for about the first five days, uh, I was in la-la land and wasn't aware. Uh, the knee surgery went well. Uh, to kind of uh, put it in a frame of time that y'all can relate to, I had surgery on March the 21st, which was a Thursday, Friday, the day of the hailstorm, uh, they had a tornado drill at the hospital, and they rushed us all into a little hall. And uh, uh, from that moment on, I don't remember anything. Uh, the next day, Saturday, I was doing great. They dismissed me. Uh, my son, our son, came and uh, brought me to Hereford. And uh, uh, Steve and Tiny came over, and Carrie was busy, and if most of y'all have had knee replacement and what we refer to as a knee bender that they put you on to exercise your knees and, and Carrie was busy hooking it up and Steve and Tiny were busy doing, Ruth had gone to get a prescription and I thought, well, I need to do something dramatic. So I started vomiting. I got sick in my stomach and uh, it was all blood and uh, wasn't a very happy uh, moment, and I, I, I want to read what a, a friend called me and talked to me before I went to knee surgery, and he said, I want you to read Psalms 4.8, which says, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And here I was uh, creating a scene, and they were busy uh, trying to get me comfortable, and uh, March Madness was fixed to start, or maybe it started, and they were trying to get me hooked up so I could enjoy that because that's one of the favorite seasons of my time. And uh, there I got sick, and in a little bit, uh, uh, Ruth came in from the pharmacy, and she said I was in the bathroom, and there I sat on a little stool, and, and I had a Walmart bag, and it was yay full of blood, and that was the second one. And so uh, they decided something was wrong, that I probably needed to go to the ER. And so they tossed coins as to whose car I was going to ride in because they didn't want a mess. And so we drew the sh short straw, and we went in our car. And uh, probably looked like a, a bunch of hillbillies going into the ER. Uh, Steve got a wheelchair and wheeled me in, and here came Ruth with the bag of blood for evidence. I guess she thought they'd give us credit for it on our bill. And uh, so uh, that was the second or third miracle that evening that, that 
was, was happening. Uh, as they told us at the hospital here, they had their A team on the duty. And Dr. Chase was in charge, and, and uh, he realized my situation when I walked in. And immediately, uh, and I know nothing about this. This is all hearsay. Uh, uh, this is kind of like a committee meeting in Washington, D.C. They don't really know what's going on. And so I, I wasn't aware of, of, of all of the actions. But Dr. Chase uh, uh, slit both sides of my throat here and took two bags of blood and inserted it into these arteries and squeezed it with his hand to to get it into my body immediately. And then they began, he began to issue commands to his staff uh, to do this, to do that, to call the chopper, to, you know, we have things to do. And so they finally got me uh, stabilized. There was not a chopper available. And uh, so they said, well, we've got an ambulance ready. That's probably miracle number three or four. Uh, the, the administrator told our family later at the hospital here, he said those doctors literally reached into the jaws of death and rescued me. Uh, uh, time was of such an essence, so they took me to Amarillo uh, in an ambulance, which probably was, was best for me uh, because if we'd waited on a chopper and all of that. Anyway, we got to Amarillo uh, to Northwest Texas uh, pretty immediately. And uh, there, uh, again, the, the ERs took over. Uh, on, en route to Amarillo, the prayer chain started on the phone, and almost some of you people sitting out here almost beat, me, beat us to the hospital. They were there immediately and started performing their act of, of prayer. I, I know my family was in prayer. They began to call friends that they knew uh, that would pray for us, and uh, it's, it, it's still going on. Uh, that, is, that is such a miracle that we've witnessed. Uh, church family, we appreciate that. Brother Chris, uh, we appreciate all of your help, and so many of you were so kind to come to visit the hospital, and uh, so when, when we got there, uh, uh, God was in charge all the while, uh, in, in that ordeal. And uh, so there the doctors uh, took over. And, uh, you know, all the time I, I remained calm and, and just was taking life easy, I guess. And uh, so we go, and, and uh, uh, all I can say is God is great. And as we sang uh, the, the song this morning just now, that's what I want to relate to y'all and, and to tell the people that God has saved my life and for what reason, I don't know. To most of y'all out there except uh, Dean back there, I'm an old man. And uh, uh, I see Dean and Mary back there uh, and Ben. Uh, in fact, uh, Dean told me the other day that his last birthday, the candles cost more than the cake. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate y'all what you've done and, and then when we got to Amarillo it was a different set of uh, uh, doctors that took over right. okay so on Sunday right as church was starting to get out we started now the family's already up there in Amarillo but folks here are starting to get text messages saying and I think Jody was the one who showed me, have you heard about Herschel and showed me the text message. And the doctors were saying, you better call the family in. I mean, this is really serious and really bad. And so you're right, we did, I'm sorry, Landon and Brent, but we did 90 miles an hour all the way up to Amarillo to get to the hospital. When I arrived, the doctors, you were unconscious. They were wheeling you in to a place to do some sort of... Uh, I don't know if it was a CAT scan or but some sort of scan. And your wife, Ruth, was running faster than I've ever seen a, a human being run to catch up because they were wheeling you, but she was almost catching you. And uh, that's when I arrived. And I caught just a bit of it. But I'm sure the family remembers and has told you, what chances were the doctors giving you at that point? Because all we heard was generalities. It doesn't look good. 
What were they giving you? Well, uh, later, one of the ER doctors out here told me with a procedure like I had, the survival rate is about three out of 100. That's not very good odds. That sounds like Las Vegas, you know. Uh, three out of 100, can you imagine? Uh, I don't know how many people here, ministerially speaking, there's under 400, and uh, uh, that'd be 12 out of this if there's 400 people here. That's, that's not much. Anyway, uh, uh, I was one of the three, and I was one of the lucky ones, but uh, quick action uh, for survival. It started at, the, at my house with the family realizing, you know, time is of essence and that we need to get busy. She probably ran faster at my house than she did with that bag of blood, you know, than you saw. But uh, after we got to the ER at Northwest, and uh, I understand it's like, this is like 7.30 in the evening, it was like one o'clock before we got into to a room in ICU. And, uh, and so uh, they contacted the doctor that was on call and uh, he said, okay, y'all keep him easy, uh, get him stabilized, and I'll be by tomorrow. Well, that wasn't what the family was really wanting to hear. And so, uh, uh, like I say, the prayer chain had started, and, and uh, like, like I say, immediately people began to arrive uh, there. And so... Uh, uh, they settled down. The next day, Sunday came, and uh, they began to ask about the doctor. And they said, well, he probably won't be by till after church, you know. And so that still wasn't the, the message they were wanting to hear. They thought, this old man needs help. So anyway, uh, the doctor came, and I think that's probably about the time Chris landed in. And uh, they decided they would take me uh, I guess, to a, a surgical room and, and run a scope down and see if they could find out where the blood was coming. Well, the scope uh, wasn't satisfactory because there was so much blood they couldn't see. So they uh, injected some dye in my thigh and tried that method, and that was later that afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And uh, uh, I think about the time I got back from, from the scope work, that's when the doctor said, look, family, if your family and, and we were all, they were all there, and uh, he said they need to probably come and say their goodbyes. So they all did. And I wish I had it on recording because <laughs> I'm sure they confessed a lot of things that, <laughs> uh, that they did and, and uh, and all of this time, you know, the, the family was just uh, in a big upheaval because they didn't have a clue what was going on. And, and uh, I want to I wanna thank my, my wife because she was the main character. And, and the kids that were there and all of the grandkids except Lacey came that day. And, and uh, how God has blessed us. You know, we have six grandchildren. They're all married, and they and their spouses are all believers. And that is such a blessing to us. And as you people who have children and are married, what a blessing you know that is, and, 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 and it is. So anyway, uh, they did the, the scope. It didn't work. They did the dye, and it didn't work. And so things were, were not too good. And... Uh, you know, I was beginning to to uh, spit up blood, and and uh, it, it just was not a uh, uh, a very good picture. Anyway, so uh, uh, then Monday uh, they did more scope work, no results, and and with the family, uh, I can just imagine tensions were mounting because. Uh, uh, what they had done wasn't working, and the chances of survival got worse and worse. And finally, uh, a, a family friend who's a doctor, uh, this, was, this was Monday, and uh, they were going to do some more work later that day. And uh, 
the, 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 the family friend suggested that we ask for surgery. And uh, on Tuesday, uh, things were not any better. And one of the nurses came and told the family, she said, uh, I would ask for surgery. Tell, tell the doctor you want surgery. And, and, and our doctor friend had told the family the same thing, says, we want surgery because nothing is working at this point. So they told the doctor, uh, we want surgery. And so the doctor on charge, uh, in charge, uh, he says, okay, we'll do surgery. Well, there's a group of 10 or 12 surgeons that work the ER room, and it's just the luck of the draw who you get. Well, again, God provided and sent us a, a team of three, and the lead surgeon was a, a neat Christian man uh, that we just fell in love with later. So he came and talked to the family, and he said, so you want surgery? They said, yes, we want surgery. He said, okay, we'll do surgery. And uh, he walked away and took a few steps and came back to the family and said, does he want to live? What a question. And the family assured the doctor that I did want to live. He said, okay, this is going to be tough. And says he probably has a 50-50 chance of survival. And so my wife said, we want you to do your best job. He said, I'll do the best job he will allow me. And uh, so things, uh, uh, we went to surgery, and they found my problem, and uh, they fixed it. And uh, he, he says, uh, we're not going to close the incision, that uh, we're going to leave him open and go back tomorrow and uh, make sure that everything's okay. So uh, they left me open, and, and uh, uh, I made it through the night and uh, uh, did just fine. And then, uh, uh, he, as I told you, he said it's going to be tough. And uh, this, uh, this was long hours in the ICU. Uh, the family... Uh, uh, was still under a lot of tension. Uh, most of them never left my bedside. And in Isaiah 41, 13, it says, For I am the Lord, your God, who takes a hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Uh, man, he was there. I, I, I'm satisfied he had my right hand, but he, he had a hold of me. And... Uh, but my chances of survival up to that point was not very good. No, no not at all. Uh, and I'll never forget when Tanya and Ruth, uh, your daughter and your wife, said that question, does he want to live? And then I asked them, what do you want? And I can't remember which one of them answered, but it was before I even finished the question, they, say, they said, we want him here. And so the church up there, the church back here, and all of us, begin to rattle the, the gates of heaven with our prayers uh, with confident boldness saying we want him back he wants to be here and so those odds didn't look good on math but they started to look really good from heaven uh, and then uh, time passed so they found the source of the bleeding Herschel was bleeding terribly internally and they could not find out where or how and and it just kept getting worse and worse, and the more time passed, it just became more and more critical. But they did find it, and uh, and then eventually, and it, it seemed like a month, but it was probably only a week, you came to. I, I'll never forget walking into the hospital, and Carrie, uh, your son, said that he had talked to you that morning, and that you interacted with him and, and nodded, and I think you gave him a hard time on something anyway. 
I said, what? That means he's here. That's, he's really here if he's giving you a hard time. What do you remember feeling as you were starting to have your consciousness come back? What do you remember as you were laying in that hospital bed and family's there and they're telling you these stories when you were unconscious? What do you remember feeling in those times? Well, uh, the incision, uh, they did not close on the first surgery. And uh, from what the family says, they covered this incision. Uh, Coach, you'll know, uh, uh, looked like a bladder out of a football. And they sealed it over this wound and, and Carrie drew the short straw. And that night, he was in charge, and so he, he applied pressure to this because uh, uh, it just needed all the help it could get. And uh, uh, I don't remember anything uh, he says about uh, 4 o'clock uh, Wednesday morning, my eyes opened, and of course I had the... Uh, oxygen and bent down my throat and all of that and uh, he got excited and he started uh, as you said he started asking me goofy questions uh, if you can imagine uh, if I'd loan him money you know <laughs> how goofy uh, and he was trying to mix me up and of course I couldn't talk so the only way I could answer was just by nodding my head and uh uh, that, that, of course, I don't remember any of that. That's what they tell me. And then later Wednesday, they went back in uh, in this incision that they'd made the day before to check to see if what they thought was everything okay. They were pleased. I had ruptured a, an artery near my esophagus here, uh, I guess in the upheaval of, of uh, vomiting. Uh, I don't know. It had been there 83 years. I don't know uh, why I chose that time to do it, but I did, and they, they got it all patched up. He was pleased with what he saw, what they had done, and they closed me up, and uh, uh, they, in, they closed the incision, and, and they brought me back. And uh, uh, I read, uh, Sue mentioned Facebook this week, I heard your prayers, I've seen your tears, but I haven't forgotten you. I haven't forgotten about you. Trust my timing, my timing is perfect. Uh, all of this led up to a successful surgery and uh, uh, later that day, uh, the, the staff was concerned that I'd been on oxygen all of these this time and uh, Sometimes uh, uh, when you're out that long on old people, it affects your mind. And they were concerned about that. And so they got me off of uh, oxygen as soon as they could. And Ruth says that after they started the procedure, there was almost a, a, a sigh of relief in the, in the operating room or in the ICU. They said, look, he's breathing on his own. And so, uh, uh, that and I don't remember any of that. Uh, I uh, the family says that I'm trying to talk, which didn't surprise me, and uh, they couldn't understand anything I'm saying. And finally, they they said I uttered, "Go to a higher power, to a higher power," and I was trying to tell them. And uh, they said, if we'd only known the higher power that they and y'all had been involved in now for days, and uh, uh, not only not only y'all, uh, every day we find somebody new that says, I've been lifting you up uh, uh, in church a couple of weeks ago, uh, a newcomer here, new to our town from California, she said, I have my church in California praying for you. The knee doctor who came by fairly regular uh, told my wife, he said, I, I don't do elegant prayers, but he said my mother who lives in South Texas does. Said, I called her, said, Mom, you need to pray for this guy. 
and said she immediately called her prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. So we find that as, as day to day, uh, people that we uh, had no connection with that uh, are praying for us. And so uh, uh, that's, 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 I don't remember any of that. And you asked me what was the first thing that I remember. Uh, it, it was uh, about that time, uh, I guess I was coming to uh, a young man, and I don't know where we were, but I know he was young because he had squatted down and he didn't have anybody with him to help him up. <laughs> and so uh, uh, he had facial hair, and he's talking to me, and I remember this well. He said, uh, I saved your life. And I thanked him. He said, I was in the, ER, in the ER room Saturday when you came in. And he said, I saved your life. And I thanked him. And uh, soon after that, a rather large guy came in, had on a white coat, knee length, sign of a doctor. And uh, he was very firm, almost gruff shaking his finger, and he says, I want you to know I saved your life. And I thanked him, and I didn't say anything. I thought some things. <laughs> and then, as they teach him in medical school, he said, what are you going to do about it? And I thought to myself, and I didn't answer him again, he said, you're going to lose weight. I thought, man, that's what they all say. <laughs> You're going to lose weight. You know, he said, uh, we put the biggest body band around you uh, after surgery, and I saw pictures. I was blown up like a whale. And uh, he said, we put the biggest body band on you that we had. And I thought, if that's the case, I know some people, if this happens to them, I can save them a trip up there because they don't have one big enough for them. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this guy was on the, on the surgery team, and, uh, uh, and I've thought a lot about when they save your life, what's a life worth? What is a life worth? What would you take for your life if a... Uh, a wealthy sheik from Saudi Arabia came over here and, and needed some uh, body organs to save his daughter at home, and he had all the money in the world. What would you price one of your children at? What would you price yourself at? You know, a, a baseball player just recently signed a contract for $400 million. When we think of uh, what's your life worth, probably immediately we think of money. Uh, what's your earning capacity? Uh, look at Funderburg or whatever his name is that invented Facebook, became an instant billionaire. What's his life worth? So when they say, I saved your life, what are they talking about? To me, uh, now, they, they made me whole. They made me healthy. And God was directing them. And uh, I thought about it a lot. What is your life worth? Um, we've got time for just a couple more, actually one more question, and I'm going to go to the last one, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. Um, how has this experience changed you? I, I would really love everyone to hear, it, and your answer may be, and I haven't asked you this until right now, so I honestly don't know the answer. It may be, it hasn't changed me, it's just strengthened me, or, or maybe it has, maybe something has really changed after going through this terrible and then wonderful uh, God-glorifying experience. So I would love for you to share anything that you have there. Uh, I'm, I'm not a street corn preacher, a street corner preacher. Uh, I try to live my faith. I try to live a Christian life. But, but this has changed me 
because I'm more aware. You know, we get prayer requests every day. It came over the prayer line, the prayer, you know, the prayer group. Uh, I've probably been guilty of not taking that to heart as much as I have, but now it has a new meaning. When, when somebody says, you need to pray for me, it gets my attention because I know the hundreds of people that prayed for me and through their prayers, God answered them. And so uh, my wife was talking to a, a lady friend of ours out of town the other day and her wife, her husband passed uh, a few years ago and, and she was telling, and she said, my husband just gave up. He didn't want to live. I can't imagine that, uh, but it has changed me. And uh, uh, when we went in on Saturday night and then Sunday when you, about your time, they were wheeling me out, uh, they said the halls were lined with friends from Hereford. Uh, some of you were there. A lot of you were there. Uh, you know, I've not been that... Uh, excited about doing those things, but I'm going to be. I'm going to be. Uh, we have friends in need today, and uh, we're trying to witness to them, to serve them, and uh, uh, I don't have a lot of strength today, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a, a, a friend to them and a helper. And God has blessed me, and I want to thank Him, and I want to give Him the glory, just like the song. To God be the glory. Uh, great things he hath done. And uh, uh, maybe that's my change. Okay. I cannot say enough. Thank you for standing in the gap for our family. We have been so blessed. Your friendship, your prayers, everything, your cards, your words of encouragement, uh, support that you have given, it's just there are no words to tell you. And it's not just our church, but our community and far-reaching out that you cannot even, we are not even aware of all the prayers that you listen. But thank you, thank you, thank you. God has been good. And definitely we know God answers 